Okay. Hey guys. Sorry, I'm running a few minutes behind. I made the executive decision to um, pause and make coffee this morning. I assure you, I do a much better job with it. So hopefully there isn't too much resentment behind that. But today we are going to talk a little bit more about volumes. You may have noticed that a number of the problems in your homework require you to set up an integral with respect to y rather than with respect to x. And I've talked a little bit about how that might occur, um, but I haven't shown you any explicit examples yet. So I want to do some disk washer problems today where we set the integral up with respect to y um, rather than with respect to x. And then I'm also going to introduce a new method. Today we're going to talk about section 6.3, which is on finding volumes using the method, excuse me, of cylindrical shells. So let me go ahead and get this going. This is, of course, Calc 2, Section 2. Today is the second. And today. Do some disk washer stuff with respect to Y. And then we're also going to introduce, or we'll begin section 6.3 on the cylindrical shells method. So that's the plan. Remember the disk washer method is all about drawing your little differential thickness strip perpendicular to the axis of rotation. We always begin by sketching the region. The axis of rotation. And then drawing the strip. I'm going to start because I'm getting a little bit tired of writing the word perpendicular. I'm going to introduce this new symbol today. Uh, if you've seen this before, that's awesome. If you haven't seen this before, that's okay. This is uh, this stands for the word perp or perpendicular. It's like an upside down capital T. It's the two lines that meet at 90 degrees. So we draw the strip perpendicular. Uh, to the axis of rotation. And in all the problems I've done with you so far in class, all the examples we did on Monday, the axis of rotation was either the x-axis or some other horizontal line. So drawing the strip perpendicular to the axis of rotation always meant drawing the strip up and down. I want to look at a couple other examples today where, where things get a little bit more interesting. And we'll start with something tame. So let's find the volume of the solid. And I'm not going to write out all the words obtained by rotating the region bounded by y equals x cubed and y equals 8. Um, and say x equals 0 about the y-axis. Oh. 
So what does that look like? Well, y equals x cubed, I know what he looks like. Looks like this over here, and then like this over here. He's got that kind of S shape. Y equals eight, I'll say is like right here. It's a horizontal line, remember, this is Y equals X cubed. And I wanna rotate everything here about the Y axis, so I'm spinning around like that. The line X equals zero, that is the Y axis. So my region, is this region. So when I, when I rotate that region around, I'm gonna get kind of a bowl-shaped thing, right? Like a bowl-shaped solid. We can all kind of see that. And the difference between this problem and other problems we've done before, this is my x-axis, I should just put a little arrow here, um, is that I'm revolving around this vertical line rather than around a horizontal line. So when I go to draw my strip in perpendicular to the axis of rotation, and so my strip is going to look like this. And if I drew it down here, it would look like this. If I drew it here, it would look like this. Wherever you draw it, it's going to have to be horizontal. So here is my little my little strip. Because it's a horizontal strip, its thickness is a dy thickness. All right, it's a little change in y that gives that strip its thickness. And if we imagine rotating just that strip about this axis, we'll get a little disk. We've seen that several times now. Something like this. So this thickness here is that same dy thickness. And then this guy has a radius. Right? This guy has a radius. I'm calling that radius capital R because remember, Capital R is the distance from the further end of the strip to the axis of rotation. So here, little r is zero. Remember, cap R is the distance from the further end of the strip to the axis of rotation. And little r is the distance from the nearer end of the strip to the axis of rotation. That's how you must think about these things. It's the only safe way to do it. I promise you, if you think of them that way, you'll never get into trouble, you'll never get stuck. But if you try to use formulas that you find elsewhere, you absolutely will get stuck. So remember, the, the formula sheet that I gave you at the end of class on Monday, where we wrote down the three kind of methods that we had so far, um, when we defined what big R and little r were, Big R is always the distance from the further end of the strip to the axis of rotation. And little r is always the distance um, the near end of the strip to the axis of rotation. So little r here is zero because there is no distance from the near end of the strip to the axis of rotation. The near end of the strip sits right on the axis of rotation. And then big R in this picture, big R would have to be this distance. So in order to find a formula for big R, what should I do? I need to know what's this point. It's on the graph y equals x cubed, so I could definitely write it as x comma x cubed. 
So big R here would look like X. But there's a problem. This thickness is a dy thickness, which means my integral will be a dy integral. And remember, we cannot mix up variables inside the integral. If it's a dy integral, everything needs to be in terms of y. Just like when you make a substitution, you can't have two different variables floating around. So I need to find some way to write this in terms of y. In other words, I'd like to recharacterize this point with y as the independent variable. And the way to do that is you come back and you solve this relationship for x. y equals x cubed is the same thing as saying the cube root of y is equal to x. So this point here, x comma x cubed, I can think of that, and it's not approximately equal to, it's the same as. It's the same as the cube root of y comma y. So this x is the same as the cube root of y because we're on the graph y equals x cubed, or x equals cube root of y. Is everybody following me so far? So what's dv then? For the disk washer method, it's always pi times big R squared minus little r squared, and then dx or dy. Here it's dy, because my thickness is a dy thickness, right? Pi times r squared times dy. Little r is 0, so this is the same as pi times the cube root of y squared times dy. I'll give you a second just to make sure everybody's following along. Is everybody with me on this? It's uh, abnormally quiet here today. Okay, thank you. It might seem silly, but I do really appreciate just the simple yeses or the thumbs up reacts, anything like that to let me know that you're following and that, and that we're doing good. And then of course, if you have questions, please ask them. Please ask them, there are no bad questions. Okay. So then, what's my volume? As always, to get v, we integrate dv. Um, I could simplify dv a little bit further. This is pi times y raised to the power 2 over 3 dy. And then v is always the integral of dv. Here, because this is a dy integral, my bounds will be y values, right? For our dx integrals, our bounds are always x values. We go from the smallest x value in the region to the largest x value in the region. But here, since this is a dy integral, I'll be doing everything with respect to y, I need to know what's the smallest y value in my region and what's the largest y value in my region. So my integral here is going to run from y equals zero because that's the smallest y value in my region, all the way up to y equals eight, because that's the largest y value in my region. And some people find it useful to remind themselves by writing the variable here, instead of just saying zero to eight, say y equals zero to y equals eight. And then in my next step, I'd say, okay, so that's the integral from zero to eight of 
i times y to the two-thirds dy. So that's not too bad. It's not too bad. This is definitely not a hard integral. Um, but the setup here required a little bit of careful thought because the curve was given to me as, as a function of x. But because the axis of rotation was vertical, my strip was drawn in horizontal, which means its thickness is a dy thickness. So I had to solve that relationship for x so I could get this distance r here as a function of y. And there really is quite a lot going on. You have to, none of it is too hard. You know, you draw the picture and you kind of follow your nose, but you have to be very consistent, very patient, very focused. Questions? And then question. Yes, yeah. question. The dv on the bottom, um, right there, the formula pi um, big R squared, that's the formula you gave us on Monday um, at the end of class? Yes. Yeah, this is the, the general disk washer formula. You got it, disk washer formula. Cool, thank you. Yep. Yeah, so the 6.2 stuff, uh, your disk washer stuff will always look like this. This will sometimes be a dy, sometimes be a dx. So when I wrote this down for you, I used dt here. The idea being that t could be either x or y. I didn't want to didn't want to force you into one variable with the formula. So the general formula for the disk washer method is dv equals pi times big R squared minus little r squared dt. And that can either be a dy or a dx, depending on what your axis of rotation is. Got it. Thank you. And I don't want to delay you anything, but just quickly, can you recap why we use a dishwasher? Like, how does that go into play here? Hmm. Well, because it's the only method we know. I mean, we, we could try to attack this with slicing, but I don't even know what this solid is, really. I just know that it's a solid of revolution. So anytime we're trying to find the volume of a solid of revolution, uh, a solid that comes from revolving something like this about a given line, the only method we've learned so far for that is the disk washer method. So that's, that's why we're using that. I will give you a new method today. Um, but for now, this is the only method we have. Uh, the slicing method is a method we use if you're given the solid overall, right, rather than given a region and told to rotate it. If you're told like, here's a pyramid or here's a, you know, some shape, find, uh, some, some solid, find its, find its volume, then you can attack that using the slicing method. Um, but if you have this rotational symmetry where your whole solid is coming from rotating some region about some line, uh, then so far the only way we've learned to find uh, volumes like that are using the, the disk washer method. Cool, thank you. <laughs> That's good. Other questions? Let's see if I don't have that page where I gave you all those formulas sitting here somewhere nice. I could show you real quick. I think this is off from. Yeah, no, that's all from before. So I'll recap those formulas for you at the end of class today. So then from here, uh, we can pop out the pi. And we have integral 0 to 8 y to the 2 thirds power. And we're integrating dy. So that's a power rule integral. We will add 1 to the power and then divide by that new power. If I add 1 to 2 thirds, 1 is the same as 3 thirds. So 2 thirds plus 3 thirds is 5 thirds. So I'll have y to the 5 thirds. And then I need to divide by 5 thirds. Well, that's the same as multiplying by 3 fifths. So that's my antiderivative step. And then I just need to evaluate between bounds 0 and 8. When I plug in 0 for y, of course, 0 to the 5 thirds is 0. But when I plug in 8 for y, something kind of nice happens. So the pi times 3 fifths, that's 3 pi over 5. And then I'll have 8 raised to the power 5 over 3. Um, and you could stop here. This is correct. And it's, it's a number. But you can actually clean this up quite a bit 
normally when you see weird powers like five thirds, you expect the thing to be irrational. But eight happens to be a perfect cube. Eight is two cubed. So this is three pi over five times two cubed raised to the five thirds. And two cubed raised to the five thirds is just two to the five. That's three pi over five times two to the three times five over three, and you can cancel the threes. So you get three pi over five times two to the five, which is 32. And then if you wanted, you could put these together. Uh, three times 32 is 96. So this is 96 pi over five. If you stopped here, I wouldn't be angry at you or anything. Um, but it is a nice observation that because this is a perfect cube, this power is actually an integer. And so when, when something like this can be simplified to something like this, I would like to know that you're able to do that. Um, but I, I wouldn't, wouldn't take points off for it. There might be instances where you need to simplify something like that inside of a problem, like as a middle step. And if you didn't, it would make life harder. So I just want to point that out. So questions on this setup. On the picture, where the labels come from, why the strip is drawn this way, how we rewrote this point like this. This is kind of a big deal. This is the, the main thing that I'm trying to drive home in the first half of our lecture today is how to recharacterize a point like this, like this. Feels okay. Okay. So I do have a, a kind of favorite problem along these lines, and uh, I would like to um to show that to you. This is one of my favorite volume problems because it can be approached a few different ways. Um, and it requires that you kind of fully understand everything. I like this problem so much that some variation of it usually shows up on my first exam. We're going to take the region bounded by the natural log function from x equals 1 to x equals e. And we're going to rotate about the line x equals negative 1. So of course, uh, one, one of the reasons I like this is because it requires that you know what the graph of the natural log looks like, and, uh, and you must know that. And it also is uh, a little bit challenging in the setup. So let's get started. Mark that as one, and this as e. Remember, the natural log dives off towards negative infinity as you approach zero from the right, and then over here, it starts to poke out and grow, but it grows very slowly. It's always this concave down, super slow growth. When x is equal to e, 
y is equal to the natural log of e, which is one. So this point up here is e comma one. And that means my region has to be this region. My axis of rotation here is not the x-axis, nor is it the y-axis. It's this other line. x equals negative 1 is a vertical line, where x equals a constant. That's always a vertical line. It's the vertical line passing through negative 1, comma 0. So here is x equals negative 1. And we're going to take that region there, and we're going to rotate it about this guy. So here's my region. Here's my axis of rotation. How do I draw the strip in? Remember, we're using the disk washer method. It's the only method we have. If I want to find this volume, I need to draw the strip and then imagine the little differential volume I get just by rotating the strip. So our next step is to draw the strip. Should the strip go in like this or like this? the strip go in parallel to the axis of rotation or perpendicular to the axis of rotation? Remember we're using the disk washer method. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah, Caleb's got it, always perpendicular. So, for the disk washer method, we draw that strip in perpendicular to the axis of rotation like this. And then we imagine what happens when we rotate just the strip. I don't have enough room here to draw it to scale, but if I were to rotate just this strip about this line, then you can picture it kind of coming out the page and on like this, you're going to get a big washer. skills are definitely limited, especially in 3D, but I will do my best. And that's all I ask of you. Just do your best. Doesn't have to be perfect. So this thickness is a dy thickness. Here is my thin little washer. So because my strip is oriented horizontally like that, the little change that gives me that thickness, the tiny little thickness there, is actually a change in y. So that thickness is a dy. So this thickness down here is a dy thickness, which means my integral is going to be a dy integral, right? It means my dv is going to, at the very end of it, have a dy, which means I'll be integrating with respect to y. What that means is that both big R and little r need to be written as functions of y, not as functions of x. So my next step would be to come in here, and label big R and little r. Little r is the, the inner radius and big R is the outer radius. The little radius would be one, right? Mm, not necessarily. So uh, remember what we said on the previous page, right? The characterizations of big R and little r. Mm -hmm. Where did I put that one? Little r is always the distance from the near end of the strip to the axis of rotation. And big R is always the distance from the far end of the strip to the axis of rotation. Right, it's very important that we get those, those definitions internalized. So, uh, so big R e? is this and little r is this distance. If I was rotating about the y-axis, then big R would be E. But I'm rotating about this line, which is a little bit larger, right? So I like to come in here and label things. Big R is 
is this. Right, the distance from the far end of the strip to the axis of rotation. And little r is this, the distance from the near end of the strip to the axis of rotation. So one of these is constant. One of these guys, either big R or little r, doesn't change as I move the strip up and down, right? Imagine, we, we like to imagine the strip as sliding up and down through this region. So whether we're down here or up here, the far end of the strip is always this distance away from the axis of rotation. Brian's got it. Yeah, E plus one. This distance is E. This distance is one. So this distance is E plus one. Another way to think of it is that the, the X, it's a difference of X values. You take the big X value minus the small X value. So this is E minus negative one or E plus one. Little r is a bit harder to figure out. So remember, to do this, we need to characterize the point here along the curve. This is x comma ln x. So I could say that little r is this x value minus this x value, which would be x minus negative 1, which is x plus 1. And that's not technically wrong. But remember, the challenge here is that our integral is going to be a dy integral, which means these need to both not have x's in them, but only y's. So how do I rewrite this as a function of y? x equals y minus 1. Um, it's not quite that simple. So this is correct. It's just not in terms of the variable I want. So what I need to do is take this point and recharacterize it in terms of y. And the trick, just like we did on that last problem where I took y equals x cubed and I solved for x, here I'm going to take y equals ln x and solve for x. And I do that by exponentiating. So if y is equal to ln x, then e to the y is equal to e to the ln x. e to the y stays e to the y, but e raised to the power of ln x, those cancel and you just get x. So in other words, this point right here, I could write it as e to the y comma y. This point right here along the graph y equals ln x could be written as x comma ln x or e to the y comma y because x is e to the y if y is ln x. So this x plus 1, I really need to write him as e to the y plus 1. Do we see it? It's a little bit sneaky. Yeah, but it's complicated. Like, I see it now. It makes sense. But it's, um, I don't know if I can do this on the test. I need more practice. Practice is key. So if you look in the homework set, there are several problems that will allow you to practice this. The particular problems, if you want to flag them as being good to practice. Oh, that reminds me. I moved the due date for homework two. Um, it was. Our normal schedule is open on Monday, due on Monday, but next Monday is Labor Day. It's the holiday that was um, fought for and won by labor unions. Uh, so it's just like we celebrate Veterans Day. We need to take time to acknowledge and celebrate Labor Day because without those unions, most of us would not be able to afford to go to college. I certainly could not have. 
Um, but the problems here that will allow you to practice the skill, let's see, the Z sky, he's already solved for X or almost already solved for X. Any of the 6.2 problems that involve revolving around the Y axis or around any vertical lines. So this guy, this is very similar, right? In fact, this is almost identical. Uh, different region, but you've got the same curve and you're revolving around a vertical line. So you're gonna have to do the same sort of thing there. And then we're getting into cylindrical shells problems. So I strongly encourage you to um, work back through this problem on your own very, very carefully and make sure you understand where everything is coming from. Because like I said, it's a great problem and some variation of it usually shows up on my first test. Question for you. Um, not really regarding this question, but more regarding the homework. I don't know if it's the appropriate time to ask the question. It's fast though. Let's set this up and then we'll switch to that, okay? Okay, cool. So I wanna finish, finish setting this up real quick. So dv is pi times cap r squared minus little r squared dy, and that would be pi times cap r is e plus one, but e plus one squared minus little r is e to the y plus one squared times dy. Okay, so now we've got our dv, we would just have to integrate that, but integrate from where to where? What would be my bounds? Again, think about this is a dy integral. So my bounds would have to be y values. Zero and one. Good, good. I go from the smallest y value anywhere in my region, which is zero, up to the largest y value, which is anywhere in my region. So I'd integrate dv from y equals zero to y equals one. And some people, again, really like to write those variables there to remind them. Uh, what it is I'm going after. Because it's a dy integral, my bounds have to be y values. That can be a, a nice save. I would like to address Rowan's question before doing any homework problems here. So let me, <clears throat> let me write this down. <coughs> integral zero to one, pi times e plus one squared minus e to the y plus one squared dy. This is not a terribly hard integral. We will do it in just a second, but before we do that, let me, let's see, how could I do this in a way that is transparent? So how do we find r and little r? First, we need to remember their definitions. <clears throat> Little r is always the distance from the near end of the strip to the axis of rotation. So can we see why little r, forget about the value, forget about the algebra. Can we see why little r is labeled like this, as this distance? <clears throat> Here's the axis of rotation. Here's the strip. The strip has a piece that's close to the axis of rotation and an end that's far from the axis of rotation. Little r is always the distance from the near end of the strip to the axis of rotation. So that's this distance. I don't know what it is exactly. I don't know what the algebra is yet, but I know that it's this distance. So to find little r, I would first label it like this. Now, if I want to actually know what is that distance, <clears throat> then I need to know what's the x value here and what's the x value here. The x value here, I normally think of as just being x because a point along the graph, y equals ln x, is x comma ln x. So r, little r, this distance, I could think of as being this x value minus this x value. The x value here is just x. The x value here is negative one. So little r should be x minus negative one. <clears throat> That's x plus one. But then I remember that
that I need to write this as a function of y. So I come back to my equation and I solve it for x. So x, if x is e to the y, then x plus 1 has to be e to the y plus 1. So I'm speaking specifically to Rowan here, but also to anybody else who's having a hard time seeing where the r's are coming from. Rowan, do you see why r is labeled as this distance? <clears throat> are you comfy with the idea that that distance is this x value minus this x value? Okay, cool. So that should get us to here. And then this, I think we could all see is x plus one, right? x minus negative one. And normally I would be happy at this stage. I would stop here and go, okay, little r is x plus one, let's move on. But because my strip is horizontal, its thickness is dy, I know I need to write this as a function of y. So I gotta swap out this x for whatever it's equal to in terms of y. And to get that, I came over here. So I know I'm, I'm on the graph y equals ln x. So if I want to find out how to write x in terms of y, I solve this for x. The way you get a variable out from a logarithm is by exponentiating using whatever the base of that logarithm is. So I want to solve this equation for x. That means I need to exponentiate both sides using the base e. So that gives me this. And then the right-hand side here, the e and the natural logs cancel. So x is the same as e to the y. So x plus 1 is the same as e to the y plus 1. Does that feel, feel good? Awesome. And then big R is even easier. Big R over here, I need to take this x value minus this x value. It's always the further end of the strip to the axis of rotation. So we can see right away that it's whatever this distance is, that's big R. And then to come up with the algebra, I just ask, okay, well, what's the x value over here? Well, it's e, right? x equals e was the far right boundary for my region. They told me that. So I know that this guy has x value e. And again, this guy has x value negative 1 because it's the line x equals negative 1. So this distance has to be e minus negative 1, which is just e plus 1. So that's where the r's come from. And I agree that that's the hard part here by far the hardest part of this problem. <clears throat> Eddie asked a separate question in chat. Do we always assume that zero is the lower bound? No. So the way we get the bounds, you look at your region here, and my region is, is this stuff. If your integral <clears throat> is a dx integral, then your lower bound will always be the smallest x value and your upper bound will always be the largest x value in that region. If you're, so if this was being done dx, if for whatever reason my strip was being drawn like this, then my bounds would be from 1 to e. But since it's being done dy, I have to ask what's the smallest y value in my region and what's the largest y value in my region? So if you think about this region, the smallest y value, that's anything down here, that's y equals zero. My region extends all the way down to the x-axis where y is equal to zero. And the largest y value in my region, that's coming from this point up here, is one. So the smallest y value in my region to the largest y value in my region, that will be, that will be my bounds. So that's how I know to go from zero to one. Certainly the lower bound is not always zero. So the, in a dy integral or a dy volume problem, the lower bound will always be the smallest y value anywhere in that region. And the upper bound will always be the largest y value anywhere in that region. And conversely, for dx integrals or dx volume problems, smallest x value to largest x value. <clears throat> um, not necessarily. So there's two different question chains floating around here. I'm going to try to stay on the chain I'm on for a minute, and then I'll come back to Connor. The lower bound isn't necessarily connected to little r. Um, little r here is a distance from the strip to the axis of rotation. So here's one way to think of it. I could take this whole picture. Imagine you delete the x and y axes. I take this whole picture, and I shift everything up five units. 
my bounds would change. My bounds would then be from five to six, but little r would not change. So the bounds aren't necessarily connected to either big R or little r. The bounds come from thinking about what x or y values are in that region. And the r's come from thinking about distances from the strip to the axis of rotation. Okay, and then Connor asked, is little r the width of the washer? The answer to that might be yes, but I'm not sure what you mean by width. So little r is the radius of the punched out piece of the washer. <clears throat> little r is the gap between the strip and the axis of rotation in this picture. And then if you imagine spinning this strip around this line, little r tells you how far you have to go from the axis of rotation to get to the actual material of dv, to get to the solid part. So if by the width of the washer you mean like the, the radius of the circle that's been punched out, then yes. Is that what you mean, Connor, or are we thinking something different? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So I haven't drawn this to scale, right? I don't have room on the page to draw this to scale. So it's a little bit, I could see how that would be confusing. Yeah, no, the, the R here is not the width of the washer. Little R in this picture is this distance. So it's, it's this, the DV picture I've drawn here is scaled down from what it would actually be. But yeah, little R is, is the size of the gap space in here. Okay. Other questions about the setup before we proceed with the integral and then we'll go to the, to the homework question. Any other questions about where the R's are coming from or why this picture is labeled the way it is, why these are what they are? Going mostly good. So I agree that to come, come straight to this, hugely intimidating, not at all easy. But if we take our time, <clears throat> patient, we trust the procedure, the procedure will work. So you sketch your region, then come in here and label your R's, sketch your solid, or the, the little micro solid, label the R's write down the formula for dv, then come in here and try to find the formulas for r's. Once you have them drawn like that, it's easier to start thinking about how to find the formulas. Once we have these guys, that's definitely the hard part. I'd agree that that's definitely the hard part. Then we can write down this. Yes, Pablo. For the disk washer method, the formula for dv will always be the same. Now this dy might be a dx sometimes, you know, it could be dy or dx. That's why when I give the formulas, I write a dt there, but it'll always be pi times cap r squared minus little r squared times d something. Okay, the integral from here is not terribly exciting, but it is worth doing because there's a, a few little little things in there that, um, that I'd like to show you. I guess first we can pop out the pi. So I'm gonna do this, Sergio, and then we'll go to that homework question. e plus one squared is e squared plus 2e plus 1, and then e to the y plus 1 squared is e to the y squared, that's e to the 2y, plus 2e to the y plus 1. So that's what we get when we FOIL. And then I'll continue over here we can distribute and combine some like terms. A lot of this is constant, right? This is constant, this is constant, this is constant, and this is constant. The only two pieces with variables are these guys. When I distribute this negative to everybody in here, I'll have minus e to the 2y 
minus two e to the y and minus one. This plus one and this minus one will eat each other up. So I get e squared plus two e minus e to the two y minus two e to the y dy. One of these little pieces is not entirely trivial. These are both constants. So to integrate a constant, you just slap on a y, right? Like the integral of five is five x, the integral of e squared is e squared times y. This piece though requires a little substitution and I like, I have a name for these, I call them micro substitutions and I would like to show you just really quickly how to handle this piece. I don't want to take up too much space in our workflow, so I'm going to come over here and do it on this, on this extra little piece of paper I have. The integral of e to the 2y dy. Who could tell me how to do that? That's maybe the, the only piece of this integral that's not super obvious. How do we do him? Or in general, yeah, the e, to the e to the a y dy. You substitute for the the two y. You substitute for that constant piece. So here I would sub z equals two y. D z is then two d y. The reason I call these micro substitutions is because the differential is constant. So there's really very little that you actually have to do to make the substitution go through. So here would be my, my little substitution box for this problem. And I would get integral e to the z times one half dz. And of course the one half will come out. You get integral e to the z dz which is one half e to the z. I'm leaving off the plus c here. That's one half e to the two y. And in general, the integral of e to the a y, let me I'll do it like this, because that's already a little cluttered. In general, the integral of e to the a x dx, this is always gonna be one over a, times e to the ax plus c, if it's an indefinite integral. Just, this is similar to, to the chain rule result that says e to the ax all primed is a e to the ax. You see how those are related? You see how this is kind of the backwards thing of this? Because when you differentiate e to the ax or e to some constant times x, you always get that constant times e to the ax. It's a chain rule thing. So when you integrate something like that, you always have one over that constant times e to the ax. So it's a little micro u sub. And I would like for us to get to a place where we can do these micro u subs in our head. Where we can do them very, very quickly. <clears throat> So like e to the 2x or e to the 2y or sine of 2x or cosine of 2y, those are things that we should get to a place where we can integrate them more or less in our head. Um, but it's totally understandable if we're not quite there yet. So if you wanted to split this integral up and do each piece on its own, right now I would understand that. But in a week or two, we should be to a place where we can do this stuff um, quickly. So I'll go ahead and write down the result here. This piece is a constant, so when I integrate that constant dy, I'll just get that constant times y. This piece is also a constant, so the integral of 2e dy is 2ey. Minus the integral of e to the 2y, that's what we just did. That's going to be 1 half e to the 2y minus 2 times the integral of e to the y well, e to the y 
just becomes e to the y. So this is what we must evaluate from zero to one. When I plug in zero, these guys are both zero, and these guys uh, are one half and two respectively. So let's go ahead and see what I get when I plug in one. So it'll be pi. When I plug in one, I get e squared plus two e minus one half e squared minus two e. And then when I plug in zero, I get zero plus zero minus one half e to the zero, that's one, minus two e to the zero, that's two. Uh, and then we'll combine all our like terms, do as much as we can here. So what do we have? I've got an e squared here and then a minus one half e squared here. So this is like one apple minus one half apples is positive one half apples. So e squared minus one half e squared, that's one half positive one half e squared. And then plus two e minus two e, those cancel. And then over here, I'm going to subtract negative one half minus two. Negative one half minus two is negative five halves, right? Two is four over two. So minus one over two, minus four over two is minus five over two. And then this minus makes that a plus. So this would be our final answer. Questions on the evaluation step? Going from here to here to here. How did we get one half e to the two y again? Can I see that sheet of paper? Yes. So we did a little u sub. e to the 2y dy, if I want to integrate that, I make this substitution. So dz is 2 times dy. I need to replace the dy, so I solve this for dy. I get dy is 1 half dz. So this piece becomes 1 half dz. And this piece is just e to the z, because z is 2y. Then I pop the 1 half out front. And I'm left with the integral of e to the z dz, which is just e to the z. And then I go ahead and say, okay, well, e to the z, that's e to the 2y. And the more general result here, I would encourage you to, to remember, uh, this is the form as an indefinite integral. I wanted to write it correctly with the plus c. Okay, that makes okay. sense. Cool. All right. Other questions on this problem before we look at that, that homework problem? This guy combined with this guy. So I've got one copy of E squared and I'm subtracting one half E squared. So when I subtract those, I get positive one half e squared. Okay then. So I do want to introduce section uh, 6.3 today, but before we do that, there was a homework question we wanted to look at, right? So what was that homework question? I think it was coming from Sergio, right? You had a, a homework problem? Yeah, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So it wasn't a question on the homework. It was just, it was just a question on the homework in general. Okay. Um, my question is, some homeworks have a button, uh, like it's like a help that lets you watch an example of it, um, mm -hmm. and some don't. Obviously, right. I know it's on purpose, because like you don't, you don't want help on every other, like every question. But it, 
do you have power of that? Can you like implement the watch button on every question if you if you can, or you prefer I, just not to? No, I don't. Unfortunately, the way WeatherSign is structured, some of the problems have a little MI master it um, option there, and that that I always include when it's available. But um, but no, I can't. Like, not every problem has the ability for me to turn that on or off. It's just something that's built into WeatherSign for certain problems. Okay, cool. Thank you. Of course. If there is a particular problem that you're that you're stuck on, though, um, I strongly encourage you to either come by office hours or take a little photo of your work, like where you're stuck, and send it to me as a Canvas message. And I can take a look at that and, um, and give you a pointer as to where to move from there. Yeah, I will actually. I'll do that. And I know your office hours are on, are on your on, on Canvas, but can you just tell me when's your next office hour? Today at 3.30. Okay, cool. Thank you. Of course. All right. So let's begin on section 6.3. This is another way to find volumes. So what we've been doing is we've been thinking about these solids of revolution as stacks of little disks or stacks of washers. But that's not the only way you could break up a solid. Another way you could think of solids, think of an onion. Instead of thinking of it as, you know, an onion isn't really stacks of disks, although you could picture it that way, but the more natural way to think of an onion is as layers, right? Because when you peel an onion, when you open up an onion, it's, it's got all these layers, and those layers kind of sit on top of each other and build the solid out. That's what's going on in the cylindrical shells method. The main reason we introduced the cylindrical shells method is because for many functions, there's no nice way to set up the volume problem in terms of the disk washer thing. So I'll, I'll introduce this by way of a, a motivating example. Let's find the volume of the solid generated by rotating the region bounded by y equals the sine of x squared um, from uh, uh, y equals zero uh, from x equals zero to x equals the square root of pi, which might sound weird until you look at the graph. I don't expect you to know right now what the graph of sine x squared looks like, but I will draw it for you. It looks like this, and this right here is the square root of pi. So my region here is this region, and I want to rotate about the y-axis. Okay. So if I wanted to come in here and set this up as a disk washer problem, my strip would be drawn how? Would it be drawn like this or like this? Is it horizontal or vertical? Yeah, it would have to be horizontal. It has to be perpendicular to the axis of rotation. Okay, so here's a little strip drawn in perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And what I would need to do then, I can, I can label my little r, right? Little r is the distance from the near end of the strip to the axis of rotation. Big R is the distance from the far end of the strip to the axis of rotation. So far, everything looks okay. The challenge comes here. So this point, I might think of as x comma sine x squared because it's along the graph, y equals sine x squared. This point though, I would, I would wanna think of as the same way. This is also x comma sine x squared. But clearly these x's are not the same x, right? One is down here, one is over here. 
So if I wanted to do this, remember that thickness is a dy thickness, so I need to find, I need to express big R and little r as functions of y. So, can we pause one second and yes. go over that? Because I'm kind of behind and getting lost. No, that's fine. Let's let's take a second. So an so arbitrary point along this curve would be x comma y, where y is the sine of x squared. So okay, I would say this is x comma sine x squared. And over here, I would have the same thing. In other words, because these two points are coming from the same curve, and this curve is not one to one, I'm going to run into a problem. Normally, what we do in this situation, you've seen in the last two examples, we come back here and we solve this for x. And that would let me recharacterize this point in terms of y. And that's what I would need in order to write r as a function of y. But because, so if I need to write these as functions of y, that would mean I need to solve. Question. Yeah. So the first point is x sine x squared, and then the second point is also x sine x squared? Well, so I'm, I'm trying to highlight that that is precisely the problem. Oh, got it, got it. Um, yes, an arbitrary point, any arbitrary point on this curve is something comma sine of that thing squared. And normally we like to write our arbitrary points as x comma f of x, right? But here, because f of x is not a one-to-one -one function, there's no nice way to get this guy, this guy, as a function of y because there's no nice way to solve this for x. So clearly, if you want to add a note over here, clearly the two x's in these points are different, right? They're not at the same horizontal location. <clears throat> But there's no nice way to solve this for x. Now you can try. You can take sine inverse of both sides. So I think maybe we use the sine inverse function. That's normally how I would go about doing something like that. So I take sine inverse of both sides and I would get this. And then maybe take square roots. So you get plus and minus the square root of the sine inverse of y equals x. But there's lots of problems here. First, the sine inverse function has some domain restrictions built in. Remember that you can only invert the sine function when its inside is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So the problem with this, this only works if x squared is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, i.e. if x is between 0 and the square root of pi over 2. So this function isn't invertible. That's the thing, right? This function is not one-to-one. -one. It fails the horizontal line test. It's precisely the issue that you're thinking about, that these two points shouldn't be labeled at the same x values because this function doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Even if you were to try and force invert this and solve for x this way, 
you still run into the problem of the domain restriction from the sine inverse function. So in other words, what is this x distance as a function of y? What is this x distance as a function of y? There is no nice way. There is no reasonable. There are weird workarounds that, that are well beyond the scope of this class. There is no reasonable way to write the distances r and cap r as functions of y. No, Bubba. No, Bubba. Hey, don't do it. Sorry, my dog. Um, there is no nice way to write these distances as functions of y because y equals sine x squared is not one to one. So that game where I take an arbitrary point on the curve y equals ln x, I can write it as x comma ln x or e to the y comma y, that shit works precisely because e to the x and ln x are inverse functions, precisely because ln x is one to one. This function is not one to one. So I can't do that. There is no nice inverse for this function, i.e. there's no nice way to solve this for x. Even if you try to force it through, that only works in this restricted domain, and I'm well outside that restricted domain. So what we need is another method. So therefore, we need a different method. And that's what section 6.3 is all about. It's about this new method. Every time we've gone to solve a volume problem so far, we've drawn the strip in perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And that's what guarantees us that our differential solids will look like disks or washers. And that's worked great for us so far. But now we encounter this problem where my boundary curve is not one-to-one. -one, so I can't do that. I can't write little r and big R as functions of the variable I need. So instead, here's what I propose. Let's come back and draw the strip parallel to the axis of rotation. That's going to give us a very different looking little mini solid, the differential solid dv that we get will be a completely different shape. But it will still be a little portion of the volume that we're trying to find, and we'll still be able to get the total volume by integrating it. We'll just have a different formula for dv. So we look at this problem fresh. I come in here and I draw my little strip parallel to the axis of rotation. And then I imagine rotating just that strip. So overall, it's the same sort of thing. It's just that for the, the new method, our strip is drawn parallel to the axis of rotation rather than perpendicular. If you drew that, now imagine rotating just this strip. What you'll get isn't gonna look like a flat disc or washer It's going to look like a soup can with the top and bottom cut off. Hmm. 
right, we'll get something that looks like this. And this little wall thickness here, that's now the thickness of my strip, the X. I guess I've gotten a little bit, you know, we should draw this top part too. Right? <clears throat> The other dimensions we need to consider are this height and this radius, which comes from the distance to the strip or between the strip and the axis of rotation. So can everybody see how rotating this strip would generate a solid that looks like this? It's empty inside. This, this is the solid stuff, right? It's just like a, a very, very thin cylindrical shell. It's a shell of a cylinder. If you imagine coming in here with some very sharp scissors, cutting and unrolling this strip, then you'll get sorry, cutting and unrolling this shell, you will get a little rectangular prism. It still has the same height. The wall thickness here is the wall thickness there. And in order to find the volume of that shell, we find the volume of this prism. The only other thing we need is this distance. What is this distance in terms of these parameters, h, dx, and r? Or what's the relationship between the geometry of this thing and this distance? Can we see it? Uh, yeah, it's two pi times the radius, right? It's the circumference. This length is the circumference of this circle. It's two pi times the radius. So here, my dv is two pi r times h times dx. And like Davis indicated, r here, if this point, we do the same sort of thing, it's x comma sine of x squared, because we're along the graph, y equals sine of x squared. So this horizontal distance is x. What is h? What's the height of this strip? What's the height of this shell? <clears throat> Anybody see that? Yeah, good, it's the sine of x squared. It's the difference of y values. So whereas before we couldn't even come up with dv because we couldn't find the two r values that we needed because this function is not one to one, there's no nice way to express this x value and this x value simultaneously as functions of y. Here, we can handle everything. I can find the volume of this little solid neatly as functions of x. So dv is two pi times x times the sine of x squared 
dx, which means v, as always, is the integral of dv. But now I'm integrating dx, so I need to ask what's the smallest x value anywhere in this region? And what's the largest x value anywhere in this region? Who can help me with my bounds? What is my lower bound? What is the smallest x value anywhere in that region? Zero. Good. And the largest? Square root of pi. Good. Square root of pi is such a nice number. All right. So we're going to integrate from zero to root pi. the function 2 pi x sine x squared dx. And this is the volume for the solid we were looking for before. <clears throat> Only now I can express it as an integral that I know how to do. All right? I'm able to get dv cleanly as a function of x. And what's more, this integral is doable. Even if we went back and looked at the other one and we found some way to force the information into dv, it would involve integrating things like the square root of the inverse sine function. Fuck that, all right? I love integrals. Integrals are my bread and butter. I do analytic number theory. It's my shit all day. Fuck integrating the square root of the sine inverse function. No way is that gonna come out nice. But this, this is not too hard. This we know how to do. How do we do this? And pop out the 2 pi, and then I've got x times the sine of x squared dx. What is the trick for this integral? U sub? Yeah, what do I substitute for? x squared. Beautiful. Right, I could shuffle that x over next to the dx. All right, this is 2 pi integral 0 to root pi sine of x squared times x dx, and then make the substitution. I'll use the symbol z um, because I want, I want us to get into that habit because starting next week, we're going to be using the symbol u for something very particular. Then dz is 2x dx. So this x dx that I have here, this is going to be 1 half dz. I also need to change my bounds. When x is equal to zero, z is equal to zero squared, which is still zero. But when x is equal to root pi, z will be equal to root pi squared, uh, which is pi. So I'll have two pi integral 0 to pi sine of z and then x dx x dx is one half of dz right divide this by two and there's the substitution done i can pop this one half out to cancel with that two and i'll have pi times the integral from zero to pi sine of z dz. And an antiderivative for the sine function is not cosine, but negative cosine. So this will be pi times negative cos z evaluated from 0 to pi. Can we pause a second? <laughs> sure. Yes, of course.
So I'm going to go ahead and start on the evaluation step here because we're a little bit past past when I'm supposed to finish class, just in case people need to go. You can always rewatch this. The video will be up on YouTube a little later today. If I plug in pi for z, I'll get negative cos pi. The cosine of pi is negative 1. So this will be negative, negative 1. And then I need to subtract from that the negative cos of 0. So that's negative, and then cos of 0 is positive 1. So this is negative, negative 1 minus negative 1, which is 1 plus 1 is 2. So this is 2 pi. And that finishes the problem. Yeah, so I understand a lot of people need to go. You've got other stuff to do. This is the end of this problem. And this is just our little introduction to the method of cylindrical shells. I'll zoom out. So starting next time, we will talk more about the method of cylindrical shells. The upshot is, for cylindrical shells, you draw the strip parallel to the axis of rotation. That gives you a different shaped dv with a different formula for its volume. This is the formula for the volume of your little differential solid when you use the cylindrical shells method. 2 pi r h times either dx or dy, depending on the situation. h is the length of the strip, or the height of the strip, and r is the distance from the strip to the axis of rotation. So on Friday, I will come in and recap all the methods we've learned for volume. Um, and I'll show you a handful of other problems that we can do with cylindrical shells. That log problem, the LNX problem we did earlier, we can also do that by cylindrical shells. Most problems you could do one way or the other. As you're working the homework, if you see a problem from 6.2, then you're supposed to use the disk washer or slicing method. If you see an example um, from a problem from 6.3, then you're meant to use the cylindrical shells method. Uh, Connor, I answered your question. I would not call this a micro U sub because the differential here is not constant. Here dz is 2x dx. So uh, this isn't one I would expect you to do in your head. This is one that, that I would totally understand if you wanted to write out. I would write this one out um, because it's a little bit more complicated. I did have to involve this variable here, the x, in my differential when I did the substitution. So there's nothing weird or wrong or, or slow about writing this out. This is the right way to do it. <clears throat> Okay. Unfortunately, I have other stuff I have to get to also, so I am going to go ahead and change the, uh, sorry, go ahead and, and end the lecture here um, because it's not constant. The bounds had to be changed. Uh, the bounds had to be changed here, yeah, because I couldn't do the antiderivative step in my head. That's the idea. So the micro u subs, I don't, I didn't change bounds there because really what I'm doing is just calculating the antiderivative in my head without going off and explicitly making the substitution. So anytime you make a substitution, if you are going to go back and redo that, the first problem that we did there, um, and you wanted to split the integral up and actually write out the substitution, then technically you should change the bounds on that also. Um, but for that particular one, the antiderivative of e to the 2y, I know right away that that's 1 half e to the 2y. So I don't even really think of it as a substitution. It's just another basic antiderivative rule. But if you were to split that up and do each integral separately on its own and actually write out the substitution for the e to the 2y integral, then you should change the bounds there as well. All right. So this is where I'm going to end it for here. Uh, please do read the textbook. Read section 6.3. It is a good section. They've got lots of other examples. And more importantly, they've got some pictures here that are better than anything I can draw by hand. You'll see the relationship between the shell and the prism quite nicely. Uh, and they'll explain things as, as well as they can. I caution you against these formulas. These formulas are dangerous as hell because they're not quite correct. If my axis of rotation is not the y-axis, then r is not x. Um, and if my boundary curves are more complicated, then the height is not necessarily f of x. So they're just talking about this particular problem. But in general, uh, the formula that I gave you here is the one that works. dv is 2 pi r h times either dx or dy. So we'll practice more of this stuff on Friday, um, and I'll show you some, some better pictures and other examples. Between now and then, please try to finish up all the 6.2 problems in the homework and try a couple of the 6.3 problems. 
this exact problem is in there, just with uh, some slightly different parameters. And uh, I, I'd like you guys to read the textbook and fiddle around a little bit so that when we talk on Friday, we can all be on the same page. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the screen share here. Are there any last minute questions for me before we take off? No, Professor, <clears throat> thank you. All right, I hope you guys have a lovely rest of your day. I'll either see you in office hours or in class on Friday.